warm welcome to all of you on behalf of the Atlantic Commission. This program comes at an excellent moment because yesterday um, the second phase of Bre Brexit started with negotiations on the future EU-UK relationship. So the question is, are you ready for some diplomatic fortune telling? Now, each panelist will give a short introduction on the future relationship, on the chances of a deal, and on the Dutch consequences. But just to set you off, I wanted to say three very basic things. The first is um, about um, the um, future relationship with the EU that Francois so frankly and rudely said that he didn't care about, but we're going to come on to him in a second. Um, but what I would say about this is I do care about it, and I do absolutely believe that it is possible to do a deal, because what we are asking for is something that is actually quite straightforward. We have been through three and a half years of this, and we have reached a conclusion that what we want is a deal on the style of the Canada deal that is based on precedent. In other words, this new administration, and it's important to understand that this is a new administration in the UK, this new administration is asking for something that should be easy to give. Second thing I'd say on that is um, that this FTA that we are seeking and the other separate agreements that we would look to um, around that should be doable by December the 31st because these are essentially political choices for you just as they are political choices for us. And lastly, we are respecting previous agreements in seeking this. So I think that this is a doable proposition, and I think it is emphatically in both of our interests to do it, and I think that we have proven that we can do deals before because we did leave the European Union on the basis of a deal. Our security is your security. We live in your neighbourhood. We are North Sea neighbours. And that is a statement of the obvious, but it's also a fundamental statement of strategic reality. And therefore, our commitment to European security is unquestionable. But we do believe that the best way to protect that security is by acting together through NATO. It's also really important for us, and again, this is something that we have very, very strongly in common with the Netherlands, um, that we do this in partnership with our friends across the Atlantic. The United States is vital for European security, and it is very much in our joint interests to keep it engaged. And I think the NATO leaders meeting in London demonstrated that that is possible, and it does require diplomacy. And lastly, I'd say that we, in this field, we do do things together. We do things with the Dutch. We are together in Afghanistan. We've been together in Iraq. Uh, I don't care simply because the difference between no deal and the sort of deal which can be cobbled together in the space of a bit less than 10 months is not going to be very great. This is not as momentous as the withdrawal agreement. Mm. That was a very big and difficult thing to achieve. You're not going to get a DC FTA uh, in that period of time, not because you're dealing with unpleasant people, because it simply cannot be done. So the technicians tell me, the trade, the trade experts. And uh, the EU actually has been doing uh, trade negotiations uh, for many years, and maybe the British have forgotten how one does free trade agreements uh, because uh, you haven't been a sovereign nation when it comes to uh, trade agreements for quite some time. Uh, uh, so technically it doesn't really matter. Uh, and I don't think uh, the fate of the EU's economy or even the British economy will be very, will be markedly different whether there is a skeleton deal or whether there is no deal. Because on the face of it, uh, the British have put themselves in a position where they create a legal obligation for themselves to achieve an agreement by the end of the year. Uh, and therefore, uh, there is no particular reason, in part for the reasons that you explained, why there shouldn't be an agreement at the end of the year. But the real difficulty is in figuring out 
whether there is a high degree of interest in the EU, but more significantly in the UK, to actually arrive at an agreement. Because if the difference between agreement and no agreement is relatively small, the incentive to work one's backsides off to arrive at an agreement at the end of the year is, is fairly, fairly weak. Uh, bilateralism and segmentation. A, a Theresa May gave a very remarkable speech in Munich last year at the, at the International Security Conference where indeed she singled out security and defense and uh, put forward a proposal for dealing with these pretty much on a standalone basis. I think she was right. Uh, and I would add that at the time, the reception from the EU side was not unfriendly. Uh, whether that is going to happen is not entirely clear. First of all, we have the bilateral part, the French-British defense relationship, which is the tightest defense relationship in the European space. This is an incredibly intimate relationship. It goes as far as any defense relationship can get between two countries. And I assume that that is going to continue. And there certainly is the will in London, as far as I can see, and there definitely is the will in, uh, uh, in Paris. The not so good news is that during the negotiations between the EU and the UK before the withdrawal, a, uh, things did not go well in the discussions on uh, defense uh, on defense issues. Uh, the European Defense Fund was negotiated with minimal British interest, so in effect they missed the train. The EU Commission was quite beastly on uh, some of the negotiations in that er area as well. And we have a situation which today is clearly uh, suboptimal, and I don't know whether tr the transition period will lend itself or not to some revisiting of issues which were supposed to have been closed by the withdrawal uh, agreement. And there are five reasons, I think, for pessimism about why we might end up with no deal at the end of 2020. The first is that negotiations about disintegration are much nastier than negotiations about integration. The second reason for, for pessimism is Boris Johnson's majority of 80 in the House of Commons. Theresa May had to put together a coalition of the Democratic Unionist Party in Northern Ireland, Conservative pro-Brexit MPs and Conservative pro-Remain MPs, and she failed to do it. Boris Johnson's 80 majority means that he can achieve no deal, if we see that as an achievement, uh, at the end of the year and keep his job, at least in the short term. Third reason... As Francois said, Boris Johnson's FTA is not that much different from No Deal in terms of its economic impact. And I would add that it's not that much different in terms of the kind of highly visible salient border disruptions that we would see from No Deal if the UK government is not ready and if businesses are not ready. Fourth reason, the two sides are far apart on level playing field issues. The EU wants the UK to continue to align to its state aid, its anti-subsidy regime, um, as that evolves. Um, and it wants uh, to be able to punish the UK with tariffs if it regresses from the current level of protection, environmental protection and protection for workers. And the UK says, no, we want to have control over our own laws. We want non-binding commitments um, that we won't regress but we don't want you to be able to punish us. And the fifth reason is that there's a distinct lack of trust at the moment. One reason is that there's a sense on the EU side that the UK is rolling back on its commitments in terms of the Northern Ireland protocol in the withdrawal agreement, uh, that uh, Boris Johnson continues to say that checks will not be necessary between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and the EU says that they are necessary, and I think the EU is absolutely right. And the second reason is that uh, the level playing field issues, um, the EU thinks that the UK signed up to something much more stringent than its current position in that political declaration. So trust is currently at a pretty low ebb. Okay, let's move on to the four reasons for optimism, which I think are ultimately more compelling. 
The, <laughs> the, fir the first point is both sides want the same thing, which is um, what I think both Peter and Francois said. They both want a free trade agreement. The second reason for optimism is that there are compromises that can be made in those areas where the e EU and the UK are far apart. The third reason for optimism is that no deal is not sustainable. Um, there will be a lot of disruption. There will be an economic shock at a time when the economy is already wobbly, thanks to trade wars, thanks to coronavirus. There's a distinct likelihood that public opinion will turn against the government. Um, and the, the government might ultimately decide that it has to go back to the negotiating table with the EU, which would be a humiliation which might let Labour in in 2024. And the final reason, and then I'll shut up, Robert, is that the EU just wants to move on. Um, it doesn't want to get into a kind of permanent crisis mode with the UK. Um, and in some ways, it's been willing to compromise as long as its interests broadly served by the agreements that it strikes. Why am I convinced there will be a deal? Because basically there is a big uh, battle going on worldwide on who sets the standards. Um, if the, I think for the, for the United Kingdom, uh, with all its trade, to the EU, which is much more than, it, than the trade it has with the, uh, with the United States, um, to have as much access as possible to the EU market is, is super important. If they don't get it, um, they will have to uh, try the US. That's why they try both and play one against the other. This is starting already. Um, now. The UK has its own regulatory system. If, uh, if there won't be a deal with, with the EU, the UK will, must try with the US, and then you will get all the chloride chickens and all, the, all these kind of regulatory standards uh, that come with the US market that the British public, I believe, uh, don't want to have. There's a lot of confusion about uh, who can be flexible on what? But I have the feeling that the EU, I mean, it's 27 countries that think differently on almost every issue and more. Um, so what we have is, the, is rules. That's all we have. And for the rest, we have different plans and different identities. This is why the EU cannot be flexible on the rules. On all these things that we have uh, handed over or partly handed over to the EU, we cannot be flexible with the UK. Because if we give them a nice deal, then all of a sudden it could become nicer outside than inside. If somebody who's not a member of the club can have a shortcut to our rules, of our rules, then you will see more exits. So in a way, this is completely existential. But a large part of what Europe is doing is totally intergovernmental. And there we are talking about fields, not the market, of course, but we're talking about defense and foreign policy. I think the EU will be extremely strict and inflexible on the rules-based part of the story, market access. Uh, and level playing field and all that. They will be extremely strict. On defense and on foreign policy, they can be extremely uh, lenient, flexible. And I believe they want to be very flexible. Then, um, third point, if I may. Since I live in a third country, and I've lived in another third country, which is Switzerland, uh, what you see is that these countries of course, they try to get the best deal possible. They have tried, and they're still trying all the time, because new things come up in the EU, and they want to take part, or they want, you know. So there are always negotiations going on. But there are two things that they have discovered, both the Norwegians and the Swiss. And this is that the EU is a big power. <laughs> it's very, very difficult to get a shortcut. So they have discovered those two. And they've told all the British delegations that have been 
uh, traveling to Bern and to Oslo, the same story. You can be sovereign on a few issues, like the Norwegians are with fisheries, with, well, not so small for them, with energy and some foodstuffs. For the rest, you copy everything from Brussels. You're a rule taker. If you want to have access to the market, you will become a rule taker, like it or not. In other words, I think one of the big problems in these negotiations is and will be for a long time, the EU is talking on a different level than the UK. The UK is looking at this in very much in terms of power, while the EU is looking at this in terms of rules and regulations.